Hello and welcome to SEO 101 The Basics. My name is Mariah Castillo and I am the Head of Copywriting, Copy Editing, and SEO at ICB Consults. For those of you not familiar with what SEO means, it means search engine optimization and it is the leading way to get your site to compete with other companies on Google. We're very excited to help you elevate your site to the next level of excellence. Here at ICB Consults, we believe in the motto, content is king. And that means focusing on analyzing and creating effective SEO for your site. This is also known as the fundamentals of search engine optimization. We will discuss that later, but first, I would like to say that our SEO practices focus on content and keywords so that Google can actually classify and find your site. This does not guarantee your site will change in search rankings or that you will be able to compete with big name sites like Nasty Gal or Target. This class is intended to create quality content, not increase site views or search ranking. Let us begin. First, let's First, talk let's about talk the history, about the history, of, the history of, of search engine optimization is simple. The history Larry of search engine Sergey Brin in had this goal. Google was had created goal. by Larry Page and Sergey Brin in 1996 with the goal of developing an integrated and universal digital library. Google was actually based on the scholarly model that libraries use to find articles in research. This is why keywords, titles, and headings are so important. Keyword filtration systems were how college students used to find research in the olden days. What is SEO exactly? SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. It is defined as the process of naturally affecting the visibility or ranking of a website or web page on search engines like Google, Yahoo, or Bing. SEO is based on two things, relevance and popularity. We'll talk about these two things in greater detail later, but first I'd like to say that relevance is the part of SEO that you can control. It's the part that has to do with content and keywords, picking the right ones in the right creative manner, that people who are searching on Google, Yahoo, or Bing can actually find your site. Popularity is what you see on social media like Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram where other people will post pictures or links to articles on your blog or website and f spread your popularity that way so that other people can find your site easier. The creative element of SEO lies in the user's choice of keywords, content, and titles. SEO success comes from this creative element. This is the particular reason why creative writers are so important for SEO and small businesses. If you find a creative writer who will be your intern or if you decide to purchase any copywriting or copy editing services from ICB Consults, you'll see that the, copy, that the copywriter with the creative writing degree is the one that is going to be able to find the most unique word that describes your product in the most particular way, and this is how you can find great success with SEO. Popularity. As you can see in the graphic, this is a link from Twitter to our site, our particular article, College for Yearly Goals. And in this link, you can see that we have a short snippet about what the article is about, and then there's a permalink. This permalink is really important when you're dealing with popularity. This is probably the only part of popularity that you can control, is that the permalink will take you right to the site. If the link is broken, that's a really big indicator that this site is not safe or maybe it has a virus or something like that, and people really won't go to your site and look at the article. But if you have a URL that's linked properly and that also has a description next to it, people will be more inclined to click on it at Twitter, and that will bring a lot of people to your site. The URL above is a backlink. To use this for your business's SEO, you have to rely on other people linking articles and pages on your site to their social media pages. This closely resembles word-of-mouth advertising. A way that you can help yourself is if you post to Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at least three times a day. If you post articles from most recent to years in the past, people will be able to link back to your blog and find what you're all about. Some helpful tips are whenever someone links to your site, thank them in a comment. 
Share a link on your social media so people can easily retweet, repost, or share their Google in their Google circle. Be friendly and check back in with people who have linked to your site and get to know them. If you were working a storefront or something that's more tangible than online, you would go up to your customers and have a dialogue with them, and you would thank them for bringing people to your store or restaurant. This is the same idea. You want people to think that you're friendly and knowledgeable, and so you're going to bring them in and have them spread your business. And if you are friendly and you have a dialogue with them, they're more inclined to do that for you. Popularity depends on how many backlinks you have connecting people to your website. Backlinks are URLs linked to people's Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and other social media accounts. These promote your website. Backlinks can increase your site's ranking on Google because Google monitors how many links there are to your website. This is not going to make you competitive with other big name places like Nasty Gal or Target just because they have so many people who already know their name and who are making them popular just by how many links they have. If you go Relevance. on Nasty Gal's Relevance Twitter is based feed, on you can see that millions this and millions is the part of, SEO of customers that you can control are tagging them in their links. links that are heavily dictated by your social For media you presence. For you to post popularity, we'll talk more about keywords later. Type. But first, stack links. I'd it like be to really show you how just viewers, blah, potential customers, blah, blah. and people just searching the net find things through Google. When you type in a phrase into Google's search bar, Google scours the net trying to find sites that have those particular keywords either in their content tags, meta tags, meta descriptions, permalinks, titles, or site SEO. If your site has more than one of the words in the phrase, it will move up in relevancy. In order to reach your target market, you have to think about what they would enter into a search engine toolbar. This is particularly difficult just because if you think of all the different people in the world and you think that they're all using Google, it's kind of hard to figure out what's most popular. If the search engine finds a match, the potential customer will then be directed to your site. The root of keywords. This is how I try and think of keywords and where to find them. You want to have low competition because remember you are fighting against people like Nasty Gal, the big sites that have very high popularity. And so you want to find keywords that aren't being used most often. That's usually when you try and find synonyms or something that lots of people know about that isn't being talked about by big name sites. I know that Nasty Gal uses cool and totally and those types of things a lot and so if you choose to go another route or fit into your particular niche it's much more successful. Also you want to have a good search volume. You don't want to have less than a hundred search searches in a particular month simply because you're taking up space with your keywords that aren't really being that effective and aren't being searched by people. There are many ways to find out the competition and search volume of a keyword and we will talk about that later. Just remember you want low competition and high search volume. The keywords that you want to find come from the spot in the graph. This is a spot of low competition, meaning they aren't powerful websites battling against your small business for this keyword, and it's also a high search volume and people are searching for your keyword. Spiders. Spiders are tiny bots that search through websites and describe them to Google. They research your robot's text file, which is the blueprint to your website. Your web designer probably has access to this file, but you can also get it on sites like Blogspot, WordPress, and other typically used sites that are used for the greater public that aren't as complex as some of the other things that web designers use. It, when you access this file, it's probably going to be blank, and what you want to do is list some of your keywords in that space. Studies have shown that instead of trying to find one keyword to rule, rule them all, it is actually more effective to use a lot of little keywords throughout your site in order to draw in search engine spiders. The places that you want to do this are in your content, your tags, your keywords, categories, permalinks, 
meta descriptions, meta titles, and your titles that are for your blog posts or products. We recommend keeping a revolving list of 15 keywords for your site. Keeping the same keywords will help your site be more clear to spiders. They will also be able to classify your site. I typically recommend 15 keywords just because on WordPress you're only allowed 15 keywords for your site. That's the same with Etsy. But having too many keywords on your site for Google particularly is probably too many and it will get really confusing for Google. I'm not talking about how many keywords you have in your content. I'm talking about the SEO part of your site where you have a few amount of keywords that Google is looking at. That's your robot text file. If you have too many, Google is going to get confused and if you have too little, you're not going to be competitive. So a good number is 15. My method, of choosing, My method of choosing keywords. There are many different methods this across the web on and how I have to, to choose use keywords, different but many of those methods Google require you to pay a Google AdWords fee. is becoming so Thus much far, more the only free way to search click based and Google for Analytics keywords is and the most effective so is through complex Google and their Keyword Planner. Putting, being put to use this method, you do not to have make to sign it up for profitable for Google, and it's often hard for the small business to pay for these types of things. So I found one free way to research keywords and it's very effective. It's the Google Keyword Planner. To use this method you have to sign up for a free Google AdWords account or a Google Analytics account and I would highly recommend creating one just so you can use this Keyword Planner not for anything else. You should keep a constantly revolving list of keywords in order to compare with competitive sites, classify your site, and make sure you are sending out a clear message to Google. As I've said before, this is the part of SEO that you can control. The trends change all the time, so you virtually have to change your keywords all the time and be researching through this thing. And it's often hard because Keyword Planner has to be uploaded one keyword at a time, so you have to go through the process a million times over just to get your site perfectly organized for SEO. But if you pay attention to the magazines you're reading, other blog websites, and you see what people are trending, it might be profitable for you just to research a couple of keywords, maybe the 15 keywords we have for your SEO site and not do the other ones. But if you really want to do the extra mile, you can use Keyword Planner for every single keyword on your site. Virtually, I only use the keywords for the robot text file unless I'm working for a client and then I research them through Google uh, Analytics and I find which one is perfected with high search volume and low competition. This is the first page you get to when you're on Google AdWords. It, I would create an account, it's free, it links to your Google account anyway, so if you have Gmail it's perfectly fine just to transfer that over. And you don't need to buy your keywords. It's going to nag you to start a campaign and I wouldn't do that just because it's on a pay-per-click system and I'll explain that later. But it's really profitable for, for Google and not for the small business. So I'll show you how to do it without paying a dime and it will be perfectly fine for you. This is the Keyword Planner. It's really changed a lot in the last couple of months, but if you look on the left hand side where it says what would you like to do, there's three options and you say click search for keyword and add group ideas. Because that's what you're doing, you're searching for keyword and you're not linking it to a campaign so you can use that side. and that option. When searching for keywords, you enter in your initial keyword idea. This will change, but it will be a starting point for you. So my example is denim. And so I put that into the first option. And then enter your landing page, which is the URL for your site. My fake landing page is happymariah.com, but if it was for ICB Consults, we would use icbconsults.com. And then you enter in your product category. So you have to go through several different options for this product category. But if you're for a fashion website for clothing for women, you would go to apparel, clothing, women's. And it's pretty easy finding which category you're in. And then you push search. I want to pay attention to the targeting area because it's going to default you to the United States, English, etc. 
And also the other side is based on campaign, so you don't really need to do that because you're not paying for your keywords. These are your keyword results. Everything on the exterior of this page you can ignore. The only thing that you need to look at is the keyword ideas. Often it will give you different options in this menu that weren't what you initially searched for, but what you initially searched for might be too basic of a term, so it will go into other things that people have searched more regularly. You might see that people have misspelled words and that it's more popular than the words spelled correctly, and that might be something interesting to play with if you want to make some of your keywords misspelled because people actually don't know how to spell as good as you would think. So if you see in your keyword results, try not to pay attention to the year plan section of the screen because that's going to want you to buy things and you don't want to do that. So the pay-per-click system, I'll just explain it to you because you kind of need to know what to avoid. Um, you can do a pay-per-click system if you become a bigger site or if you start making a bigger profit because then you'll probably be able to afford a campaign. What it basically does is that you buy a keyword for however much it's being sold for. So if you can see the average price, it's on the list. And then every time someone clicks on your site, it will uh, charge your account and then Google will make that amount of money for every click. I don't re recommend doing this because it's going to cost you a lot of money if your site becomes very popular and all of that revenue is going to go to Google. Also, it shows up in the left-hand margin or the top portion of the Google search results, which are usually in blue, and people avoid those because they're trying to get you to buy something. Oftentimes, people are on the internet just to be informed and just to like scope what's out there and see articles and get information, and so they're ignoring the part of the site that wants you to outright buy something. So keep in mind what we've learned about low competition and high average monthly searches. And those are actually Google two AdWords categories account. in the keyword Google AdWords is a lovely way to track keywords, and it can be trusted because it's affiliated with Google. Typically, Google does white hat SEO, and we'll talk about white hat versus black hat SEO later. But you can trust Google because they ban sites that do things wrong as far as SEO. If you're ever looking for something like how to create a site, I would go to Google Information Desk just to find out how to do that because Google is a very, very good site that can be trusted. However, buying keywords in a click and pay process is tricky. It places you in the right hand margin like I said before and it also is pay per click so every time someone clicks on it your account gets charged and you don't know how many times people are going to click. I would suggest researching your keywords and filtering them through your site. There is no need to buy anything if you do SEO correctly. And that's what I really want to be forewarning about when I'm talking about SEO because a lot of people are out there just to get your money and say that there's a guarantee, but there's really no guarantee. I've read countless articles about how SEO is turning into content and keywords, which is actually just learning how to write good copy. And that's when the SEO specialist can come in with a creative writing degree and really help your site better than the person that wants you to pay tons of money just to get up in the search rankings. Along with that, I would say that writing for humans is probably my main goal when doing SEO. It's identifying your target market before you create a website and hopefully before you create a business. The target market is who you're marketing for and oftentimes you can see this in big sites like Nasty L as I've been using an example before, is that they know who their demographic is. It's the, you know, young 20-something going out on a Friday night. And by doing that, they really categorize what they're talking about, and all of that condenses down into one message that they're sending to Google. And so that's a really, really good way to get your site to write keywords that might get clicked on. Once you get your target market in mind, quit trying to write Just keywords that might get clicked on and picked up by something will be clicked on by If you think a word is trending searched by people in Google search bar, um doesn't mean that it's actually true. A lot of trends fall out of fashion very fast, as we can see in the fashion and celebrity markets. And so it's really important to think about the human element instead of thinking about what's hot right now. It's important that you write keywords that a general public will search and click. 
Remember, people often spell things wrong and those searches count. For example, dexterous and cute mean the same thing, but nobody will search for dexterous. Don't be so obscure with your keywords that people will never search for it. This is why the keyword planner is so helpful. But another synonym for cute is dexterous, and so you need to think about that too, is that are people going to be using cute or dexterous? Another example is beautiful and beautiful, which are spelled incorrectly, but oftentimes searched. And they're probably searched the same amount of times, and if not, the misspelled version is searched more than the correctly spelled version. How to brainstorm unique keywords. Two helpful links for this are guidelines, tips, and tagging, and tagorama keywords, which are from the Etsy blog. These are really helpful because they help you hone in on your niche. Once you know what type of business you are, you can scope out the competition. Find out what other sites are using for their keywords and find the synonyms. Dig out the fashion magazines, business books, and start paying attention to the media. Once you immerse yourself in the market, you will be able to understand the vocabulary you should be using. Oftentimes for me as a writer, I find that I just don't have the particular word that means what I want it to mean. And so when I do my research, I can often find those words that I don't have to explain and new words that people always use that I've never heard of before. And I've been doing this for four years, so if it happens to me, it'll happen to anyone. There are a million words out there, so you just really need to do your research and keep up to date with those types of things. Also, be creative. Increase your lexicon and find out what your target market's lexicon is and buy a thesaurus. If the word doesn't exist, create a new word. If you're creating a hashtag, make something quirky and fun out of it and use puns and all sorts of similes and metaphors just to make it super interesting. Those types of things are going to be more profitable than finding out things for spiders because people like to be entertained and, interform in and informed while they're on the internet. And if you can do both at the same time, people will really be receptive for that. How to brainstorm unique keywords. This is a spreadsheet that I actually use and this is the best way for me to find out what keywords I should be using for a particular garment. And since I'm in the fashion industry, this is what I'm going to be talking about right now, but it can also be applicable for other types of business. And so what I start out doing is I take the name that the client has given me for the garment. And so in this particular one, it was a vintage beaded vest. And so I was thinking about what it actually was in like its most simple form, and that would be a vest. And then also, what specific type is it? And in this, I always think, like, what is the cut? Where does it fall on the body? Is it flattering? Is it long sleeve? Is it short sleeve? Does it come mid-waist, etc.? And that's where you need to, like, be way over-detailed, more than maybe your client is or you are, and figure out every single aspect of that garment. Because on online shopping, people don't know what they're buying. They're buying a picture and when they get the product to prevent a return, you really need to be specific in that. Also, I do the main material, which the client gives me. It's always on the tag of the garment. Uh, the main colors, and if the client says red, I'll always pick a really more interesting synonym for red, like rose or blood wine or something like that, because those are trending right now, the really particular interesting colors and people often are looking for that like vintage cool new word and so the color helps them find that also the method oh no. Let's get it back. of making it is very important just because a lot of things that I do for Tasha's site are vintage handmade things and so People are really inclined to buy things that were like made from home or made from a particular region, so I am sure to include that. And what size it is, which is also very important. What style it is, and this is where I have to get out my fashion magazines and styling books because I am not a fashion expert. I'm a writer, so I have to find out what the vocabulary is, like what's the difference between 
plaid and argyle. Um, and so when I find those types of words, I include them in this category. Um, a lot of the times there will be trending words like scalloped or um, tribal print and you just need to be up to date with those things because if you use them in the wrong way people will definitely notice that. Synonyms is from the Etsy tag list that I uh, talked about earlier. Um, these are often things that you would say when you're out shopping with your friends when you're like oh my gosh that's so glam oh my gosh that's so cute and trendy and fun and uh, people are really inclined to that because they want the same shopping experience that they get in the actual store. So if you put those in this column, it will help them find that type of feeling. Also, what era is it from? Uh, people are interested nowadays in vintage, as we've seen in how many vintage sites pop up on the net, like Mod Cloth and Etsy as well. And they're also very inclined to this new contemporary type of fashion. So... It's important to find out what era it's from, and sometimes that can be a little difficult. I know I've gone through Google finding out like what the difference between Victorianism and uh, Edwardianism is, and that's kind of frustrating, but Google is right at your fingertips, so you can research that. Just be sure that you're correct. And also the descriptive XC tag list is the last resort for any type of adjective that will describe this garment in, and I usually just stuff those into that category. white hat versus black hat SEO. And that's what I really want to get forward in this slideshow is the difference between white hat and black hat just so you don't waste money with a black hat SEO specialist. And this happens all the time is that people say they can guarantee something that they can't actually guarantee. And SEO is never a for sure thing. It's always about the writing and it's never about paying to get a higher ranking as I've been saying this whole time. So Black Cat SEO usually uses techniques that are morally questionable. In techie speak, Black Cat SEO refers to highly aggressive SEO strategies that do not cater to a human audience. For instance, spandexing, stuffing, paying your way into site views, misrepresenting your site, and neglecting content. Misrepresenting your site is a big thing that even you can accidentally do, and I'd like to talk about that right now. Um, if you see something trending online, for instance, let's use Kim Kardashian, why not? If, <laughs> if you see something like Kim Kardashian trending online and you put it in your keywords and in your tags, and Google looks on your site to see if any of your other content has to do with Kim Kardashian and, it's at, and it doesn't, then they'll actually block you because you're misrepresenting what your site is actually all about. And so let's try not to do that. It's kind of hard because sometimes you write an article that's not like any of the others, but Google hardly ever does something wrong. So just steer away from that type of idea. You really want it to be actually what you're talking about. Also, there are some words that are spammy um, and that's like uh, guarantee or uh, like super cheap or vintage for less or anything like that. And if you use those too much, you can get on the Black Hat SEO list for Google as well. That's not as easy to control, but sometimes if you repeat yourself too much on your tags, like say you have... Um, trending fashion, fashion forward, and flirty fashion all in a row, and it looks kind of spammy to Google, you'll be put on the watch list. So you just have to be sure that you're being original every time, and you don't always have to use fashion in the tag if you have it beforehand. Unfortunately, Black Hat SEO tactics get more site views, but it also guarantees you a banned site sooner or later. And so I would recommend using White Hat SEO, which is based on ethical practices of search engine optimization. With this strategy, you're not going to be blocked out by Google, and you can sleep easier knowing you are giving customers and clients the content that they need. White Hat practices are sustainable, and they help your site grow. 
stuffing. Stuffing is one of the unethical SEO techniques that it is, is a one-way ticket to a banned site. This is what you, SEO used to be all about in the late 90s, but it's outdated and now doesn't work. The actual technique is when a site owner or specialist picks a keyword and uses it every single chance they get in order to boost ranking for their particular niche. For instance, let's pretend I'm an SEO specialist who is trying to boost ranking on a coffee shop. A page on my site, if I were using the stuffing technique, would look like this. If you drink coffee and you are a coffee drinker, then you should buy coffee at this coffee shop where we sell coffee. Not the bad kind of coffee, but the good kind of coffee. The coffee that coffee drinkers like, like you, the coffee drinker. You know coffee, and we know coffee too. Let's talk coffee, 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 yeah. So obviously this is ineffective, and it's not good if you pay a black hat specialist that does this to your site, because then you'll have to go in and fix it. So do your research before you hire someone who's going to do this to your site. And also, you can see that this type of method is kind of like a car salesman. That's what I like to think about it as, because they just won't let you leave. They won't let you stop thinking about this particular thing that they want you to think about. And it's often just trying to get you to come to their site as soon as possible and then also notice that they sell one thing, coffee. And so you'll buy that product from, from them. And a lot of sites do this, and it's a one-way ticket to getting banned by Google. So why is SEO so important? SEO can help build your business tremendously. It goes hand-in-hand hand with a powerful social media presence, which is becoming the number one way to get your business across the World Wide Web. As you can see with as many business owners who own Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, it's becoming the number one way to get your site out there and get your voice heard with all of the competitive online retail and also products and services that are being distributed online. So SEO is a strong tactic that closely resembles local word of mouth. And if you think about it that way and you think about not reinventing the wheel but actually using tried and true business practices, then you won't be steered wrong into Black Hat SEO. If done incorrectly, Google can ban your site. And knowing about SEO, even if you don't do it yourself, is helpful in order to hire a particular SEO specialist that won't get you banned. Becoming aware of the dangers of Black Hat SEO is important for every business owner. How to get banned from Google. How to get banned from Google. Google can block your account from its search engine. And it doesn't tell you that it's banned you. 99% of the time they have a legitimate reason for blocking your account and they don't make a show of it. After they ban you, you have to completely revamp your site. Change SEO, change your site titles, change all the article titles, change all the content, change all the tags and keywords, redo all the content, and redo the links. Once you're done cleaning, and keep in mind that you don't know why Google banned you, you have to re request reconsideration from Google. It's a long line of paperwork. Then you have to sign up for Google Webmaster Tools and submit an XML sitemap to Google just to make sure that you're not doing your same old nasty tricks. Then build new quality links to your website that will parent you until Google fully readmits you. This is like having a babysitter on the internet. Never do this again or Google will ban you for good. And it takes a really long time to fix. In that time, you will have zero customers and lose tons of money. Content. This is what we've been talking about in a sense. Keywords build content. And oftentimes when I'm writing an article or product descriptions, I start with the keywords first and build the content around them. But keywords and content are separate because content is what's actually teaching your customers something. Keywords are more inclined to make them buy. Content will keep your potential customers and clients on a web page. It's any copy on your site, for example, blog posts or about me sections or product descriptions. When potential customers read your content, they put a person behind the brand for the first time. And believe me, on the internet, first impression is everything. It takes three clicks to get a customer to buy something or follow your site. And let's not forget that you're talking about humans here. You're not talking about SEO spiders traveling the net that you're trying to hook them in. You're talking about people who are actually going to be interacting with you and your product and you want to treat them fairly. Write content that is intelligent, free from grammatical errors, full of wit and personality, and please teach the reader something. Nobody will remember your name if you write boring content. 
It is the appeal towards human emotion that provokes a buy. If you aren't a good writer or cannot articulate ideas grammatically, which happens a lot with business owners. I mean, a business owner can't be smart at everything, and also, you're doing a lot. You're wearing many hats, and you're also probably the only person who is on the employee role, and so you might not have time to write copy and to research keywords, etc. Hire a copywriter, then. ICB Consults offers copywriting, copy editing, and SEO, and you can get it all in one if you'd like. If you need more content but don't have time to write, hire a ghostwriter or guest writers. I know lots of times celebrities will write as guest writers or your favorite blog writer will write a blog article for you. And all you have to do is change the SEO and you have your content and it will be perfect. We will now open the question and answer portion of the webinar. Thank you for listening. If Google is the only search engine that my clients use, do I have to think about other search engines? I would think about other search engines. This is a controversial debate between SEO specialists because Google is such a leading member of the search engine uh, clan. Um, but Yahoo, Bing, and Ask are also things that people use often, Bing being one of them that's up and coming, which I never expected. And so you just need to see if the trends on Google are actually the trends on Yahoo, Bing, and Ask. And you can find this on Bing or Yahoo's uh, screen page, the first page that you get to on their site, and see if theirs is trending in the same way that Google Trends is trending. And if those are the case, then you can see that they're pretty much on the same page. But in all honesty, lots of people use Google, so you can do either way. You could use Google, or you could go on the other sites and figure out what is the similar trends. Next question. Why should I and my search engine specialist keep updating my SEO? Search engine optimization changes almost daily. I know from particular experience because Google just updated their keyword planner. It used to be the keyword tool. And that keyword tool was like the most amazing thing ever because you could search multiple keywords at once and you didn't have to deal with the whole AdWord thing. Like you didn't have to pay for keywords or whatever. So uh, when it just changed over, I noticed that like a lot of the keywords that I had been using for a really long time weren't being searched at as high of a volume and when I researched that I realized that since the trends are changing all the time the keywords are changing all the time and so every month now I go back in and I figure out if the keywords are doing the same things that they used to and a way to prevent that is to go to the Google Trends page which I have linked right here and see what's new and what's happening and what's hot right now and see if you can like line that up with your site's keywords What if a larger company is using a keyword or keyword phrase that would perfectly describe what you're trying to communicate? I've had trouble with this a number of times. You have to try to find another keyword, which is really hard because, especially when you're working in the fashion industry, a lot of the words are exactly what you mean, and there's absolutely no other word for them. Like peplum, which is a big trend from last fall, where there's absolutely no other word that you could use to describe peplum. So I usually use like tulip or something like that, that means the same thing and that people will get at, but it's really hard when you're doing stuff like this um, to find original words because a lot of people use the same vernacular all the time. I also had this problem with uh, military inspired fashion, which is also a huge trend from last summer. And I had to find uh, new words and new arrangements for military-inspired fashion, and so I used Authentic Army Camo, which is basically the same thing, but it's not being competed against with, like, American Apparel and all those things. So that kind of worked for me, and oftentimes if you have more than one keyword in a phrase then it will be a lot more unique and a lot of the big companies won't be using that exact phrase. Should I submit my site to a linkage company? 
Absolutely not. Um, do not submit your site to a linkage company. Uh, there's no easy way to build links or valuable content, and that's exactly what a linkage company will want you to do. If you submit your site to these companies, what they'll do is put your site onto a revolving scheme with other sites. So there will be one site that links to your site, and then your site will link to another site, and it will go all in a circle and build your popularity but at the same time you're in this circle of like a bad neighborhood like these bad sites that all like just are in it for each other and just in it to get profit and Google can track that and see that oh every time you're being linked it's by this particular site and oh look at this particular site it's linked to another I bet they're in a linkage company um and so just do it on your own and build your content and your site will perform to the best of its ability This concludes our discussion on SEO 101. Look for our this next webinar our discussion SEO on 102, SEO 101, which talks about the details. Look for our next webinar, SEO 102, about content, grammar, which talks about voice. the details. Content, and grammar, also we and have voice. SEO 103, which is for SEO the particular site, which is for is you, the particular business owners, and we will take your comments and answer them on our e-course. For added information to sign up for ICB copywriting, copy editing, or SEO. Contact us at info at imperfectconcepts.com. Also, visit our website, icbconsults.com, imperfectconcepts.com, and blog.imperfectconcepts.com. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram under Imperfect Concepts, and we'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you, and have a great day.